So hi, welcome to our talk. I'll introduce myself first. My name is Nick Saunders. I am our, I'm responsible for cybersecurity for Viasat's government group. Uh, I am also, you know, an engineer. Uh, I've worked in engineering for 15 years. Um, you know, I've done, I started in embedded systems. I, you know, recently got to launch uh, a bootloader that I wrote into space, which I was pretty proud of. Um, you know, more recently, I've also kind of worked into, you know, upper layers of the stack. I wear a lot of different hats. In this context, though, talking about these events, I'll be sharing my role um, as one of the primary investigators for the KASAT attack. And so we will be going through these different series of attacks. And so uh, Mark, my colleague as well, will be uh, going through and giving us an introduction on these. And then I'll be taking it over for some uh, technical investigation and analysis and really telling our story for what this looked like. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Mark Kolaluka. I am a network and security engineer by trade. I did a lot of work on layer two packet processing on some of the design of our first and second generation satellites. Uh, now I am the CISO at ISAT, which in this context meant one of my uh, great jobs was dealing with the outside world to kind of give a protective bubble for all of our engineers and forensic responders time and space to do what they needed to do. So I'm going to go pretty quick through an overview of the satellite network itself, just to baseline everyone. I apologize if this is a level of knowledge many of you are familiar with, but it's good to set the context so when we get into the detail of the two different attack variants, you understand the parts of the network. So with that, how do I advance? It's not moving. OK, sorry. Is that better? Sorry. Sorry, guys. It's and not. That's and that's our talk. And that's our talk. Yeah, it's not moving at all. We may need IT help. We may. We may. The arrow buttons, the space bar, and the. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Hey, thank you. All right. So what are we talking about? Uh, February 24th, 2022. This is a graph of our terminals online on a particular section of the KASAT network. The way the network is segmented, um, actually, we have kind of by ge geography, but also to load balance, we have different segments of the network. And you can see up until about... Um, 0300 or so UTC, about 60,000 modems online. And the two arrows there represent the two different attack vectors that we're going to talk about today. The first one, you can see a gradual decline in the number of modems. This ended up being uh, a result of some network-based attacks that we're going to get into in detail. They commenced there, but they went for several weeks in intermittently and in different fashions, and you'll see how the attack actually morphed. And that ended up being a DHCP-based attack that manipulated both the protocol and the packets and some other things. The second, which is probably the more widely publicized and discussed, is the modem wiper event. So we're going to talk about the reverse engineering of the malware strain uh, and the toolkit that came with it and kind of a little bit of the lateral movement that led to the deployment of that. But that resulted in somewhere in the 40, 45, 50,000 modems being affected it, there was a bit of a long tail on this as modems came back online. We had some instability in the network because of the activity as well. This is what the network is. Each of those are spot beams. Those are where the users live. So you can see it covers most of East and, Eastern and Western Europe and some of the Middle East. The satellite itself was launched in 2010. It uh, was used for both broadband and satellite TV access. And at the time of the events, there was about 110 to 120,000 commercial modems on there. We also support commercial aviation and government customers at the time in a separate partition. One of the messages I want to, want to emphasize here as we go through this, the priority was and is on the customer base that we have. 
If you notice from that graph, there were still 20,000 customers in the affected partition still online, still using the service. The other partition had you know, upwards of 40 or 50,000 at any one time. So we had a pretty big focus throughout the incident response and the forensic analysis on preserving the stability and availability of the service. And that's a guiding point you'll see Nick highlight throughout. And with that, I'm gonna talk, turn it over to Nick to talk a little bit about the background and some of the things that we were seeing early days and then he'll walk you through both attacks. All right, so first word of warning, don't believe everything you read on the internet. Um, we're gonna go through a couple of things that, you know, as we went through this attack, uh, we were also reading the news as it was going out there and there was, you know, for good reason in some cases we were not sharing information because there was information that was, you know, close. We were, our main priority, as Mark mentioned, was keeping users online and, uh, you know, ultimately patching any, any findings that were out there. But one of the things that was kind of going on simultaneously was a few different pieces of reporting that we're also here to want to get information out, correct the record, share, get, you know, ultimately get uh, the details around what this attack was and was not. So a couple things, you know, one was that the attack was so effective that every one of the KSAT ground user terminals that was turned on at the time shut itself off and could not be powered up. That is not accurate. We'll go through why that's not accurate today. Uh, you know, also attackers were able to enter a ground-based satellite network in which Viasat's KASAT uh, users were running by exploiting a vulnerability in the Fortinet uh, VPN. Uh, there was no evidence that we found or that any partner has found, uh, and forensic evidence directs us elsewhere. It was not a, a zero day to any knowledge or, any, or a vulnerability that was known on the FortiGate. Um, there was, in fact, a FortiGate VPN. We'll go through that. Uh, but that was not a, a vector. And then the, um, the third one, malware was, you know, part of a larger supply chain attack. Maybe if you define supply chain extremely, extremely liberally, then sure, anything could be a supply chain attack. But there was no evidence of any compromise or tampering with a Viasat modem, software, firmware images, no evidence of any supply chain interference for uh, supply chain to Viasat. So I want to correct that. And then uh, the last one is that, um, you know, this is my favorite one. They deployed wiper malware to erase the hard drives of the modem disconnecting them from the KSAT network. Modems do not have hard drives for the record. I, I actually kind of like this one because this is, you know, to be fair, this is the more accurate one of these four, but modems do not have hard drives within them for the record. Um, the, on a more kind of personal basis, my, ex my experience as, a, as an engineer on this, an investigator on this was, uh, I got a call from uh, my boss at 6.45 a.m., so thanks a lot, um, you know. Uh, who here likes 7 a.m. daily stand-ups? Can you raise your hand? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> yeah, yeah, was that your idea? Unfortunately, it was. Uh, <laughs> we had a bit of European partner and time zone issues, so unfortunately, I couldn't accommodate everybody's request for a noon Pacific, so. Maybe next time it'll be different, I don't know, if I publicly shame him. Um, but, you know, so as, as our teams, you know, a, a number of different cybersecurity people got roped into that call because it was an apparent, it, se it appeared to be a cyber attack. So, you know, every, everybody was really eager to help. Let's get involved. Let's go dive in, figure out what was going on. And what we found out very quickly on a practical basis was, you know, Mark mentioned the KSAT network, you know, that was operated by, you know, a partner that was operating that network. So on a practical basis, we as engineers and responders didn't even have access. You know, we, we had to log into, we had to get access to log into that network and that network was actually through that partner operated, as we were later finding out, you know, operating other networks as well through that same, the same data center. And so there was some hurdles that had to be worked through and our partner graciously did accommodate, you know, bringing us in as a, an extended part of the team to investigate. And so, uh, you know, here's, our hopefully chart, which is, you know, this is our wish list that we wrote up on the whiteboard of like a couple other things, you know, later, but you know, the initial ones, we just wanted to get access to a jump box, get us into the network, you know, get us tw port 22 access to terminals so that we can investigate. So we talking through, you know, we wanted to be able to connect to a terminal over the air, log into it and, and diagnose what, what, uh, what was going on for some of the terminals that were online. If I can add there too, yeah. I was very unpopular with the engineers because one of the first actions we did was hit the giant red button, which only not only uh, severed all of our management access to KASAT, but also to other Viasat networks around the world because we weren't sure if other ones were vulnerable or at risk or under attack. So I was extremely unpopular with a large amount of the ops and the forensics teams because I made them crawl through broken glass to get access. No comment. Yeah. <laughs> 
So I'm going to take you through our knowledge. What happened initially? So what did we know? What did we not know? So Mark shared that graph earlier. That was one of our initial pieces of knowledge. The next thing that we learned was that there were complaints from distributors that some terminals would only light up with a solid white LED, which is not normal. And then the second piece of knowledge was conflicting, which is that other terminals would light up with a blinking blue LED, which was another abnormal case, but that they do not provide communications or enter the network. And so in both of those cases, those were not normal conditions. I didn't know what these lights meant. And so, you know, first RTFM, like let's take a look at the instruction manual and figure out what does it actually mean when you get a blinking blue light or a, like a solid white light. And so if you look on here, solid white means initial power up. That's an early stage. That's not good, you know. Um, the other case that we reviewed was the, the pulsing blue case. The device is busy, but working normally, so that means it's booting up, I guess. But, you know, it's busy, so we didn't really know more detail than that to begin with. And so I'm going to step back a little bit before we go into a, a ton more, because one of the things that we had to do, that I had to do, that other incident responders had to do, was get familiar very quickly with a legacy network architecture. We've got multiple different generations of different network architectures, and so we had to come up to speed. So I'm going to bring you up to speed. I knew a lot of this, but you know, we all had to level set. And so we're going to level set in this room together on a satellite communications network. Kind of, this is a little bit biased toward the way we do it, but. In general, we're trying to stay a little bit, you know, provider agnostic in, in this view. So typically, excuse me, typically you have, you know, customer premise equipment um, that's like an end user device that connects over hardwire or Wi Fi to a terminal or a modem. Um, that interface is usually with the home through a router that's also coupled with that modem. Uh, then you have an antenna that communicates over RF to a satellite. I like to think about a satellite as a big mirror. I mean, it, it basically does frequency translation from one frequency to another and then, you know, beams that back down over a different frequency band, but really it's the same signal. And then it goes back down to a ground gateway system, which then is responsible for converting RF into a MAC layer. And then you end up with a core node that's often providing, depending on the network, maybe layer two, layer three services, and then you have different sophistication levels of, a, you know, of your core node, as we call it. Um, that include different things. And so going through those different elements, you have a control plane, which is, you know, for us, a, a control plane really means signaling to a device, you know, you know communicating with a device, um, getting the network to function, uh, making changes. That's controlling of a network. So that might be instructions down to a terminal. That might be communication of a terminal to authenticate itself with the network. And that's where you see our first bullet, AAA. So every single modem, on our network, on the KASAT network in this case, but on every network that we're running has an identity. That identity, you know, terminals have their own private key. They have their own public key. They authenticate with the network uh, through a AAA server that is responsible for making sure that when entering the network, a terminal is authentic and has a service plan and all of that. You also have DHCP. DHCP, as we know, is a protocol that's used for uh, giving an IP address, for example, but many other things as well if needed. So you can do configuration of different settings. And so there's a lot of different parameters around DHCP. That is actually one of the areas we'll, we'll be diving into throughout this, uh, throughout this presentation. And then on the management plane side, you have other things. So you've got device management. So that might be things like pushing software images down to terminals um, through distribution mechanisms, through image servers, and things like that. Uh, that also includes, you know, as I mentioned earlier, getting SSH access to terminals. We were able to use SSH to servers, to terminals, things like that, to uh, interface down with uh, different systems within this network. Um, and then server at router administration, typical things to be able to manage the different systems that are involved in that core node and ground network. And so that's, that's kind of what we call those is our ground network is kind of the, the summary of that little element. And then those connect a user to the internet or in some cases maybe private networking setups. And so um, that's, that's an overall topology. I will pivot toward the KASAT more specific network layout. And so kind of knowing all of that, you know now what, that, what a data plane, what a control plane are, what a management plane is. This network was made out of, you know, if you look at, at the left-hand side of this diagram to orient you, again, are the users. There's users with modems or terminals. Um, and those users in the KASAT example were served by different partitions of a network. And so we call those bandwidth aggregation points um, in the KASAT context. Those are um, 
BAP1, bandwidth aggregation point one, served a regional set of users. Uh, shown on the left, those are commercial users. BAP2 was also a different set of users. Um, and then BAP, the, the last one was a Viasat operated mobility core, which was also, it included you know, different systems. And one of the elements on this was, there's a partner operation of that BAP1, and then uh, BAP2, and then we were uh, responsible, and there was pretty much a different core node network that was assigned to that uh, management network of the Viasat operated one shown down on the bottom for mobility and government cases. So how many people in this room know which side of the network the attack came from? So I'm going to ask audience participation, raise your hand if you think that the attack came in from the left-hand side of this diagram. OK. Raise your hand if you think that it was on the right-hand side of this diagram. OK. Everybody's wrong because I didn't see the same people raise their hand from the second one. Maybe, maybe one person, OK. So I'm going to go through first. Everybody's familiar, I think, generally with the reporting around the wiper attack. So we're going to call that method number one, the wiper attack. Um, that's been very widely reported. So we'll go through this. We're going to go through our investigation of this. But the other side of this was a different view of crafted attacks that came from terminals. And we haven't gone through those widely, and so we're going to break those apart and what those crafted attacks looked like, which were focused around denial of service activity on the network. So we didn't have, I'm going to be fully honest that, uh-oh. It's on this side? OK. OK. Yeah. Yeah. We'll deal with it. Sorry, guys. <laughs> The right side of the room is now in the wrong. Um, OK, so I'm going to be fully honest. This, this team structure developed over time as we learned. So as I mentioned, we only knew a couple things at the very beginning. We knew the lights weren't turning on correctly, right? So we had to create these teams dynamically on the fly. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk through these different efforts because there were a lot of subject matter experts, engineers involved that all deserve a ton of credit for the work that they did. And so the analysis that we're going to go through, I'm going to represent the work of a lot of others that were investigating on these different investigation efforts. And so that was our, our kind of typical, like high-level team layout for these different response efforts. So we're going to dive in to the wiper attack investigation first. And so you know, the first, the first step that we wanted to do was get terminals brought, into the, uh, brought, brought in from Europe and into our Carlsbad labs. That was in California. We wanted to bring them in, ship them in from Europe, get them in. And so we shipped them. We had to get them through customs. Friday, we're supposed to get them. Customs attempt number one failed. You know, there is, somebody got turned away through customs and honestly, come back tomorrow was, I think, the answer that happened. And so uh, not knowing all the details, uh, our first attempt to get these terminals into country failed. And so we got them on Saturday and laid them out all on a conference table in a, in a room. And, um, so what we did on this conference table was there were different sticky notes. There were different pieces of information kind of annotating these different terminals. You, Mark, had requested kind of, uh, do you want to go through kind of what you requested from the, the yeah. distributors? So since we didn't really understand what was resident on them or what it talked to them, we have similar type modems on other networks. Also, this was a completely air-gapped room, but we wanted to make sure from a protocol standpoint that we did not tamper with or adjust or inject anything that wasn't there when we received the modem. So I required them to establish a protocol specifically, for example, of no transmission pins were being enabled when we did the reverse engineering or the analysis because we wanted to make sure that what we were uh, getting his output was exactly what was there, and we hadn't tampered with or altered it in any way. Cool. So as these modems were arriving, one of the things we were also doing was, what, what's our plan of attack? Like, what do we want to do when we first get these modems? And we constructed a plan, wrote it up on a big wiki page, and then said, OK, here, when we get these terminals, here's the very first thing we're going to do. Here's the second thing that we're going to do. And so the first thing that we decided to do was we want to engage with these modems through console. We just want to pull logs. And so we had to do some hardware outfitting to uh, change these terminals so that we could connect to them through console. Uh, shown on the video on the right is actually a, um, a modified version of a UART connection 
because of one key constraint that we developed in our plan. We did not know any state about these terminals. There was no wiper write-ups on the internet. Nobody knew anything about this. So kind of putting yourself through our lens, we did not know if there was code on there that as soon as you connect a TX pin that might transmit into, the, it might wake up and then adjust the way that is behaving, wipe itself, you know, we did not know what was resident on these terminals that we got in. So we wanted to be very careful not to lose any state because we all know how hard it was to get something through customs. So we didn't want to mess that up. So that's a three pin UART where you might otherwise see four. And so what we first did was we pulled logs and this was one of the terminals where it was a white light terminal. And so that white light terminal meant it was an early boot failure. What we saw in our experience was that the on the left hand side, the not working version of a terminal actually did not spit out logs past a very early stage of the boot sequence. And so what we did was, okay, that, that informs the way that we're going to think about these further. Our next step in the process that we had identified was we're going to look at JTAG. And so we're going to connect to these boards through JTAG. So that's exactly what we did. We got our hardware teams to outfit these boards properly. We, um, there are a number of people that made some changes to properly get us uh, you know, a JTAG connection so that we could do a boundary scan, do a JTAG connection to these boards, um, and to pull, con uh, pull the, the, the chain of what was actually there on the, the uh, that was all connected to the JTAG chain. So we did that connected. Um, there are a couple of different versions of terminals. And so uh, we'll talk about the different variants of those terminals later, but we had to do some different outfitting for kind of the different versions of those terminals. Um, but the approach that we took was to modify U-Boot to dump Flash. We wanted to see what was in there. We wanted to get everything out of that terminal because we knew that like the early stages, you know, if there's a boot failure, the boot, the boot sequence would ultimately read from Flash. We knew that we needed to pull Flash content. So that was the first thing that we decided to do from there. So after this, we started to pull content from Flash. And we were able to see, OK, this, this is a, a little bit of a, um, a weird set of content. I don't know if the uh, audio will be connected to this. So let's see. OK, so I'm going to, there is a, um, on this side, this is the very first time where we compared the content of Flash from a non-working and a working modem. And so what's shown on this is we're, we're looking at the left-hand side computer that you'll see here. On this screen is a working terminal. You can see there's multiple different bootloaders and there's multiple different stages of bootloaders in a different file system. So there's a bootloader file system. That bootloader file system included the contents. And so um, that would, those are images that U-Boot would ultimately boot into for a stage two and a stage three boot sequence. On the right-hand side, you can see the flash content of the first stage bootloader. And then you can see at the very end, you saw it before, but as we scroll through this, you can see a decrementing value of the flash content. And so this was our initial, you know, this is the first time that we ever saw flash content on this board. So that's a, that, that had a couple of unique things about that. That was a decrementing value. That's not just you know, a, something that could have gone wrong. There was a decrementing value that was the content through flash. So that looked wrong. And then the last thing that you'll see as we scroll to the bottom here is there are also no contents in the file systems. There's no partition table for either of the file systems that those should then read from and then boot into the next stage of the, the bootloader. And so all of that looks wrong. So that was our first readout. And that, that happened, we learned that on Sunday night. So the attack happened on February 24th for this wiper attack. And then on February 27th, Sunday night, we worked through Saturday to Sunday. Thank so many thank yous to every engineer that was involved on, over the weekend. People were diving in to help. Um, but we, what we did was uh, get a good understanding of the content of Flash. One, one thing just to note that, that Nick just mentioned, too, is the removal of both file systems. That's pretty typical of modems of that generation to have, like, last known good. So both of those file systems appeared to be dropped such that if the modem rebooted, thought it had a problem, if it had the ability to get past first stage, it would go back to a known good image. So it appeared that both of those might have been um, been removed or at least altered. Cool. Mark, do you want to take this one? Yeah, I'll go really quick. Yeah. Um, so during the weekend, while we're doing the hardware analysis on the modems, a uh, toolkit was found on one of the management servers, if you remember that management plane in, that, in the core node. The toolkit was a that's the actual name of the file if you see it, and it was dropped to us on 
3.42 a.m. Sunday morning, it was retrieved, that's central time. And that toolkit contained a number of scripts as well as some, I'll say, suspicious looking binary files. And so we ended up kicking off one of those other threads that Nick mentioned, kind of the reverse engineering and analysis team. So Nick's gonna walk you through what we did with the toolkit, which includes figuring out the sequencing of the contents of the toolkit, reverse engineering the binary itself, and then a detonation step to actually verify that it produced the same kind of outcome that you just saw on there. And in parallel, we actually, as part of our standard incident response, Mandiant's our forensics and investigation partner, they commenced uh, uh, on March, I believe Monday, February 28th, is when we engaged them, and I think the very next day is when we gave them contents of that as well so they could start their investigation and forensic analysis. Cool, so as I mentioned, there are a couple of key questions, and, and, and we didn't know a ton in the very beginning. So we had a, a number of different questions about the toolkit that was found, and we had, we had a lot of questions, and, and a lot of those questions affected the way that we were thinking. So some of those questions were, what other capabilities did the toolkit have? Did it have evasion capabilities? Was it selective over targets? How did it erase flash? Could anything be done to stop it? Could walking dead modems be recovered? Could it self-propagate? There's a lot of different questions that we had about this toolkit, so we wanted to understand what, the, what, what was actually there. So this was, we spun out our toolkit reverse engineering team, which consisted of a gentleman I really do want to give credit for, credit to, Jonathan Wyatt, um, and a, a couple of his colleagues, Andrew LaMarche. Um, these, these gentlemen uh, were able to quickly use an NSA open source tool, Ghidra, uh, to investigate, um, we'll go through the, the investigation that they did in a second, um, from that toolkit, uh, but one of the first things that they did before that was to do an emulation through KMU. And so they installed the, the uh, one of the key binaries that was found in this toolkit. I'll go, you'll see an image of what was contained in that toolkit on the next slide. Um, but they emulated the way that this malware um, or this binary would actually behave uh, through KMU initially. And so they were able to see a distinct Pattern, we recognize that pattern from before, from what was actually recovered from the modems that were in the field. And so another key question that we had was, was this malware actually the toolkit? Or was that a decoy? We didn't know. And so we had to pair those two things together. So on this slide, this is a picture of what was in that toolkit from a summary perspective. So as you look at this toolkit, there are a series of files and scripts all kind of centering in around use of SSH and SSH credentials to distribute an executable down to a terminal. One of the key things that I want to highlight about what was in this toolkit was there were a couple of different ways that these attackers were you know, interacting with their scripts. There was a series of files. Some of them had gotten changed. Initially, it seemed like, and we're, we're speculating, um, initially it seemed like there was a hardware list we don't know the order in which these scripts were, were executed, but there was a hardware list. On this network, based on what everybody in this room now has seen, there's a satellite communications overview. This is not one layer two broadcast domain. So the, you know, doing an ARP-based lookup for terminals doesn't actually even work on this network. Um, so it looked like that attempt was then you know, changed into a, in favor of a different attempt. And so there was a series of different um, scripts and files that were all centered around distribution of this executable down to a terminal. And so we wanted to figure out what was actually in that executable. Anything to add? No, I'm good. Cool. So we wanted to figure out what was actually in that executable. And so as I mentioned, we used the NSA tool, Ghidra, to understand uh, what was actually in the executable, what did it do, how did it work, does it make the same pattern? And so uh, one of the things that we quickly did was it takes, if anybody's used the tool before, you have to spend a lot of time you know, renaming functions, you know, understanding syscalls, understanding numbers. And so this is kind of the derived version of syscalls mapped back up into an understanding. This was created through an internal document um, by the, the internal document was finished on March 2nd um, within our team. So really proud of that team for their work. The next thing that we did was we also, let's detonate it. Let's, let, let's, take, let's get some sacrificial terminals. And so one of the things that's really cool about this, um, this event was the way that the teams rallied to be able to respond. 
we were able to quickly acquire terminals from a lab that we had on a shelf and detonate. So sorry, terminals. You guys are <laughs> you're the unlucky ones. Um, some, some of these terminals were then pulled into our lab, our response room, and we detonated, we distributed the, the kit down, or just the executable down onto those terminals. It was a MIPS binary. Um, we executed that MIPS binary on the terminals and we're able to see that it does actually have the same effect as what, so, so now we had three different independent signals that all correlated together to understand that this toolkit was in fact the toolkit. Um, that really did help us to understand what was actually there, what, what, what everything was. So just to kind of summarize our initial attack conclusions, um, we went through and developed an understanding of, you know, the attacks happened at 3 to 4 a.m. UTC. I'll go into the other attack, which happened around 3 a.m. UTC on Thursday, 2.24. Modems arrived on Saturday. Sunday night, we had discovered flash content. We had read that flash content, understood it. And then our teams then were also able to reverse engineer the, the toolkit and understand it. Over the series of days, they were kind of streaming in information on that. Um, that reverse engineering process because, oh cool, this is what I found, okay, it's, it's really looking similar to that. And that internal final publication of that document, or that final document was, um, was kind of created by the, the March 2nd timeframe. So Mark? So just to kind of put the conclusions to a picture for us, based on the forensic analysis and a little bit that came afterwards, but essentially an attacker through known Tor node exit relays, unauthorized access to that VPN with compromised credentials, pivoted to a management server, which actually a different set of compromised credentials, went to a network ops server to do some recon during this time period. That's the stuff about trying ARP and, hey, what, what modems are alive or can I reach which parts of the network? And then pivoting to the place where we typically do distribute software images, but just using that particular place to stage the toolkit. And um, this is it kind of pictorially from a timing perspective, what we saw actually the first attempts were about five or six o'clock in the evening trying to get access to the VPN, we had several failed logins. First successful compromise with unauthor unauthorized access about eight o'clock in the evening. Then it took about two hours. I don't know if the attacker or attackers needed dinner, put kids to bed, whatever. Uh, went to a management server, hung out there for a little bit. Then went ahead and said, I'm going to go check out the network right around 10 or 11 o'clock that evening. And then about 11.30 through 1 a.m. to 2 a.m. went to that, that server, started staging the toolkit, and then started executing attempts. But it looked like about 04.15, as you saw the arrow with the precipitous drop is when essentially sent out this over the satellite network, just going modem to modem down the row and sending the toolkit, placing it on the modem, and then executing it. Once the binary was executed, it performed the flash memory overwrite that you saw with that pattern, and then attempted to reboot the terminal, which would put it in an inoperable state. Okay? Now we're going to talk about the other, the control plane attacks. If you remember, these started at roughly 0300 UTC. And I want to emphasize, while they were going simultaneously, throughout that morning, there was some intermittent behavior, and they also continued for several weeks as some of the methods and means that were being used. We had mitigations deployed. They would pivot to a new technique. So I think we've seen this slide already. Just to orient, now we're talking about the second method. Um, and so this, this, sec this second method was crafted attacks that came out of terminal. So we're going to decompose that. And what were those crafted attacks and what can we learn from those? Uh, we have since gotten the chance to apply a lot of, uh, all of these fixes onto our networks. Um, and then I've also been working to generalize the understanding to say, okay, what other attacks could look like this? And so that's what we want to get out there and inform the community of. And I'll, I'll add to that, this is one of the places through private sharing forums and direct communications with other SATCOM and yep. service provider, this, this is a more, I'll say a more similar pattern that other service providers might use to provide control plane or signaling or IP addresses. So. Even though these are specifically manipulating things we use in our network, certain DHCP option fields, et cetera, we thought it's generalized enough that we should share. So this was some of our earliest sharing, both directly with SATCOM operators as well as through our government sharing partner. 
One thing also to call out on the prior slide is that this fell then into the other track that we had formed as part of our incident response, which was the network and infrastructure analysis and response teams. And so those teams were a series of sub subject matter experts and security engineers that were all kind of responding ultimately to these network-based attacks. And so this was a distinct track from the others, but we were generalizing the learnings and understanding and aggregating them into a composite picture the whole time. So as we go through this, we're going to look at uh, this first attack example. So in this first attack example, we've attached a timeline to initial DHCP request volumetric attacks that we saw starting at 3.02 a.m. UTC on February 24th. If you recall, the prior graph that Mark mentioned, you saw that initial drop off and then you saw a steep drop off. This was around the same time of that initial drop off of terminals when you started to see that was due to effects to the network entry process that were caused by these crafted attacks coming from terminals. And two other points I just want to make on this one. One, if you see the legend in the top right, I mean, these are legitimate modems with valid subscriptions all throughout that beam pattern that was, there was no localization, like they were all in one place or on. These are just essentially random modems that appeared to be doing this. The second thing to note on, there's that gap in the middle, it looks like it kind of stopped. Well, part of that was due to the instability in our network because of the volumetric attacks. Some of the elements that Nick's going to describe stopped responding, crashed, reboot, analyze, take it offline, take a node out of service. Cool. So. Now I'm going to dive in. I'm going to decompose a control plane a little bit more than we have so far. Uh, so you have a customer premise equipment. You have a device of an end user. You have a terminal. Then you have a gateway. So that terminal communicates ultimately through the satellite, through the gateway. And then that gateway makes a decision uh, depending on whether that traffic is control plane or data plane. Um, and then that, uh, that traffic ultimately flows through. The, an ASN is a role. Uh, within a system architecture for the network. Uh, this is a virtualized ASN that then that system then acts in the DHCP context as a DHCP relay. Uh, that's an extension to the DHCP RFC. Um, and then there's DHCP servers that are facilitating DHCP requests and responses. There's a AAA, as I mentioned, for authentication and servicing of that. And then there's a couple other systems that are involved. So. Um, as we decompose this, this is a little bit small. It's an eye chart, but I'm gonna I'm gonna talk you through this. And so, this is attack number 2.1 of three different attacks that I'm gonna decompose that we saw happen on our network that were these crafted attacks from terminals. So the precondition for this attack first is that a terminal must have valid access and an identity within the network. So you must have a, a terminal specific private key. You, you have to be authenticated within the, uh, the service. You, yeah, you're so real. Terminals that might have been stolen or haven't been provisioned yet, they don't yet have that kind of key, and they go to a walled garden for an installer to go install it. So the, you can't get to this place in the network, if you will, unless you're a valid subscribe, you know, a terminal with a valid subscription. Prior to that, if you hadn't paid your bill or the service was suspended, AAA would send you somewhere else. So this is, this is a pretty important point. This is a authenticated itself to the network using its key and it's got a valid subscription. Cool. So kind of from that precondition now, you see the next, you have a user device which issues a DHCP request up to a terminal and then that terminal then sends that DHCP request on. This is a terminal that in this case is not acting as a router. There are sometimes cases where if, if you've got a router involved, then the router might act as a relay for that. So it it, this is the case only where um, it's assigning an IP address, essentially to like think of your home router basically. The home router gets an ISP IP address. That is that request, right? So that DHCP request is then filled out. Um, it's sent across to the gateway. The gateway then propagates that to a VASN. Um, and then that ultimately then gets relayed to a DHCP server. So in that DHCP request, in the DHCP RFC, I think 2131, um, it, it defines uh, a client address as really like a, it's the CH adder field is essentially an opaque key. Um, that opaque, excuse me, that opaque key um, can be anything that you want. It's essentially a hardware address in this context for a uh, modem um, that then uh, might include, there's kind of two variants to this attack if you want to execute it. One would be to uh, set your client 
hardware address to any, um, and then associate a requested IP address, which is DHCP option 50, with the IP address of a target terminal. And so this is what we saw from the attacker, where uh, there was IP addresses of target terminals that were in these volumetric attacks. You could also, when we reviewed this, you could also do the reverse. And so when we have since then applied that into a, a patch, we've had to think about and generalize what are the other cases that we didn't see but could also then be used. And then kind of winding ahead to the DHCP server, you can see a DHCP request to a DHCP server that says the request is invalid, it doesn't match an active lease, and then a NAC is then sent from the DHCP server to the VASN. That VASN system then is you know, responsive to that NAC. It shouldn't have been in this case. That was the problem. So the VASN takes an unsolicited NAC and then is confused into issuing a command on that control plane to disconnect a terminal from the network and that ultimately would knock a terminal offline. So it was a fairly sophisticated way to use multiple different, essentially DHCP system roles to confuse multiple systems operating together. And so if you think about this within buzzword zero trust context, you have to think about what are the ways that um, you might be able to confuse systems where the DHCP server is implicitly trusted from a VASN? So you have to think about how might that affect something else and how can you ultimately prevent that from happening. So I can wind pretty, pretty quickly through the rest of these. You have a, a second variant of this attack, which is a DHCP decline attack, which we saw which is ultimately issuing a DHCP decline for a target terminal. Um, that then causes a DHCP server to r really not care about that. That actually confuses a VASN to then disconnect the terminal. This was, we responded to this and then um, were able to dis uh, disable this request. And then lastly, same exact attack, but through a DHCP release method as well. So this is a bit of a cat and mouse game. Uh, from a response standpoint, you know, we saw one attack. We saw a DHCP request attack, we saw a DHCP client, a decline attack, and then we saw a DHCP release attack. Every time we would make a change, we would then see uh, you know, within days response and then within hours as we got better at it, and then the responses would change over time. And then later we applied this into the threat modeling context and then ultimately hardening of these different systems. I so will, I, will, summary, I will say just the attacker or attackers also displayed similar responsiveness time when they had definitely had ways of testing and viewing and observing what changes or behaviors that we made, and they responded pretty quickly. So what specifically did we do to defend? Wouldn't an adversary like to know? But I, I, the things I will share here is um, that we you know, quickly applied filters to control plane systems to intervene, disable these requests. Uh, we set up a dedicated control plane slice. We had engineers dedicated to this to set up a dedicated slice that was a Ukraine only control plane slice to keep that segmented from the rest of the networks on the fly. And so the control planes were then separated at that point. That was a pretty prideful moment when we had that new control plane slice online and you know, dynamically responding to those addresses. And then lastly, um, I'm gonna just kind of give a shout out. There have been a lot of different engineering teams that have been involved in RF attacks. This is not, so we've seen attacks from different cases of a, you know, attackers um, that are out there around uh, you know, RF attacks as well. That's not, it's not these, just these domains that we've had to worry about. And so this has been a very ongoing series of events for us. Uh, we've seen eight different changes of RF interference over the last year. So this has been a pretty active domain. So our ask, yeah. Oh, I was gonna say, no, I'm ready to. Yep. Go ahead. So our ask, you know, service provider networks, especially SATCOM, are especially complex. You know, Leo, Geo, whatever that is, right? They're, they're complex systems. So as you think about those, you know, we know what complexity introduces in the community, right? That, that introduces vulnerabilities. And so you have to think about the system complexities. And so one of the things that we want to share with this community is our ask. So, yep. Yep. so our final kind of slide, our ask, we, we have a traditional bug bounty program through Bug Crowd. We typically have campaigns that are, are kind of user-facing things like billing systems or customer support portals. In some cases, it's our corporate infrastructure. So we're announcing an expansion uh, for the research community, kind of if we get vetted researchers through Bug Crowd, we're gonna ask for some help by providing terminal kits and service to uh, selected researchers 
to be able to test over-the-air methods and attacks for disrupting a particular canary terminal in there. This is the kind of thing that we would love to engage the research community to think of ways that maybe we haven't considered yet to manipulate or interact with a terminal. So basically, uh, interest in resume portfolio for our responsible disclosure program. Uh, we'll take um, submissions in September, kind of review those and select some, uh, select some researchers, hopefully to have some fun with our network. So I want to thank everybody for their time and attention today. I appreciate it.